Okay, dear participants, welcome back. And we're starting our next session. Uh, Professor Kupriana, please, the floor is yours. Oh. Dear friends, colleagues, hi. Nice to see you all. Mm -hmm. It's a great honor for me to be a moderator in this meeting. It's called uh, Strategies of Non-Alignment in the 21st century, the topic is very interesting, and it is no coincidence, I think, that we have two speakers today. Both of them are brilliant experts, and what is special pleasure for me, uh, they are my good friends. I want to introduce you, Andrei Sushansov, Director of Laboratory of International Trends uh, Analysis Program, Director of Alday Discussion Club in Gimo University, and Nandan Unikrishnan, Honorary Research Fellow of the Observer Research Foundation from New Delhi. I think that such a combination, one expert from Russia, other from India, is the best suited for a conversation on the topic of non-alignment until now India has been a leader of the non-alignment movement and Russia is now learning this complex and difficult lesson to be a non-aligned state. I will gladly give the floor to our speakers, but first I'd like to say a few general words. Uh, what is non-alignment? In fact, I think it's a kind of uh, neutrality or maybe just another word for neutrality. Uh, if two actors start a war with each other, the third actor has, I think, four possible options. First, it can join one of the parties. It's a good option, in fact, but a risky one. It will strengthen the side it joins and it's more likely to win. But the side did lose, our country would have problems. Uh, secondly, it can join one of the parties and change sides during the conflict. It sees uh, the enemy is winning. This option is even better, but uh, there are two problems. First, the enemy may feel uh, that it will benefit more from your defeat than from your betrayal. And secondly, even if your plan works, it will bring you tactical benefits, but uh, great strategic problems because you will be considered an unreliable ally in the future. The third option is that you remain neutral until the very end of the conflict. You do not spend forces, you do not spend resources, but you also do not receive direct benefits from the result of the war. And fourth, you remain neutral until the key moment. And your intervention in the conflict brings victory to one of the parties and this option has only one weak point, you will be considered a cunning fox, always looking for your own benefit. Uh, I'm a historian and as a historian I can say that in different ages one of the other options uh, looked preferable. Uh, in the warlike society of ancient Greeks, uh, ancient Greece, uh, neutrality could even become a pretext for an attack. In a feudal uh, medieval Europe, it was considered shameful. In these times, uh, when countries do not receive land and indemnities as a result of the conflict, neutrality or neutrality to a certain point uh, looks more and more attractive. Uh, well, let good strategy, in fact, uh, let others exhaust themselves in the Cold War uh, while we calmly accumulate our strength. In fact, I see two problems here. First, our culture is largely rooted in the past and neutrality is often considered something almost shameful. Ask any Englishman how he feels about Ireland neutrality in World War II. Or ask a Russian what he thinks about Sweden neutrality in World War II. It used to be considered shameful to sit in a tree when there is a battle for a just cause nearby. Uh, now this attitude is changing, but very slowly. And the second problem, if the battle is really great, uh, then you may not be able to sit in a tree because two fighting giants can accidentally knock down your tree and you will have to take part in the battle when you are not ready. And these two problems are now facing Russia because we used uh, always to be a player on the field, to be always in the center of the fight. And now we have to learn to stand aside and wait for a moment. Uh, now this issue seems especially difficult for us because the conflict is unfolding between two powers, one of which, uh, United States namely, defeated us in the Cold War 30 years ago and has since treated us with a great contempt, a great suspicion. It's not su surprising that this attitude uh, has awakened many of desire for revenge and that many people sympathize with China in this fight. Andrei, uh, my first question for you, uh, 
So what do you think? What should Russia do? Should it join the fight or learn neutrality? You can talk about what you want. You have 20 minutes, but I would be grateful if you find time to answer my question. Yeah, floor yours, please. Thank you, Alexei. I think your metaphorical description of the several modes of conduct of uh, great powers is uh, very illustrative. And I would probably agree that uh, for at least 200 years, it was very hard for Russia to stay aside and not being involved in a major fight. First, because uh, Russian territory is such huge that it essentially borders every single significant center of uh, power gravity in the world. Um, and uh, basically, if something happens on Russia's borders, this eventually draws Russia in voluntarily or involuntarily. Uh, it happens that the uh, gravity center of uh, global power now shifts towards Asia. And this leaves Russia in a specific position of being more of an observer rather than an active player. But uh, to, be an, in, to have your observation uh, a kind of active, not being passive, not being reluctant, but being able, active, uh, engaged, um, being prone to affect change that is uh, necessary for your, for, your, for your interests and be able to maneuver between the major competing countries uh, that eventually helps uh, to develop and achieve your own interest. That is an important, an important task. I think uh, the um, wrong metaphor that, that people currently using to try, trying to describe Russia as a power in contemporary uh, international um, dynamics, uh, they they claim that if Russia is, uh, say, too restrained, like in Nagorno Karabakh, Russia is losing. Russia, for some reason, is uh, diminishing its capacity. But they are using the metaphor of uh, early Soviet Russia or Stalin era Russia, when Russia voluntarily, you know, assigned neighboring countries what to do with their own borders. Soviet Russia said to Finland, Finland, could you please move your border from Leningrad? And uh, Finland first said no, and then said yes. And in between there was a, a war. Then Russia pointed to Turkey. Turkey, could you please move your border? Turkey said no, then it, it, it contemplated and eventually uh, together with Greece joined NATO. So that was a kind of a politics that, that Russia is uh, Long, no longer uh, conducting. And what we have seen in the Nagorno Karabakh case, there was very soft, but still deliberate and uh, very sophisticated, um, engaged maneuvering that implied that at some point Russia would intervene. But the capacity of this intervention was very, very important. Throughout the conflict, we saw that several scenarios have been voiced, some of which by, by the members of the parliament. Uh, they said that um, we now observe the, the appearance on the battlefield, some of the Islamists from, the, from, from Syria, and this possibly makes an anti-terrorist campaign around Nagorno-Karabakh a legitimate cause. That was one of the case, and that, was, uh, that, th that could have led to Russian intervention on a very different uh, in, in a very different context with a very different role. But the current role of a peacekeeper of a side that has basically put most of the efforts forcing two of the combating parties to negotiate with one another, I think that is the most preferable uh, way to intervene in the conflict and eventually have an opportunity and, to take initiative in it. And uh, if the best case scenario would result in a sustainable peace, that would have a benefit of an opening of borders in the region. That Armenia would not be blockaded by Azerbaijan and Turkey. Russia would persist in, in, in being present in South Caucasus as a major geopolitical player, as a major transport um, player, as a player uh, which affects energy routes and transport routes in the region. And that should be the biggest fruit of the possible um, 
military of the actual military escalation that can lead to a possible amendment. But uh, if we are not discussing exclusively Russia and would try to figure out what non-alignment would mean to some other uh, participants of the global affair, we understand that uh, besides Russia, the number of countries that are being active, that are being able, that are being forceful and uh, that are claiming to be leaders, particularly in their own region, and showing not only the uh, like contempt to be a leader, but also a capacity to be a leader. This leads to a much more complicated global order than we have seen throughout the Cold War. We use with my colleagues in the Valde Club, we use the metaphor of the crumbling world order. This metaphor describes how um, the still stable and still durable system that has been built after the Second World War, it still exists, but it starts to crumble even though we see that the permanent members of the Security Council of the United Nations are still the most able and leading, uh, particularly in the military sphere, and they are the countries that decide on the question of the world war, basically, or avoidance of the world war. We, we, we see a lot of countries like Turkey, like Iran, some countries in the Southeast Asia, uh, aspiring countries in Latin America, they are claiming to be the major centers of gravity that are climbing, that want to climb to the top. And uh, what does it mean actually to climb to the top in the world order that is crumbling? I think the concept of non-alignment is uh, interesting to, to uh, for those countries to contemplate whether they would Rather, uh, rather than then seeing world to become a, once again a bipolar, they want the world to be a multipolar but still stable. And how you can achieve it? You can achieve it through uh, direct negotiations with another power centers about the rules of engagement. Uh, so if we are observing that the individual states are becoming increasingly more important in this new order rather than system being more important. The states themselves become more important. Uh, the, this new system that, that would replace this existing one would eventually emerge as a result of the actions of those states. And uh, do we actually have um, a way to assess the, or measure the country's agency in international affairs, their impact? We have small countries like Israel, for example, that is, uh, located in a very hostile environment that is still very forceful uh, and um, it basically develops a strategy, a leadership strategy that um, it has built an internal motivation and a foreign policy strategy aimed at maximizing use of very limited resources that Israel has. And eventually uh, Israel reaches national purposes and the national goals with uh, uh, great efficiency. And uh, if we assess that the world is becoming a less stable, more hostile um, place where countries strive to develop their own agendas, we possibly should should look for, for Israel uh, as an example. We can also say that countries like South Korea or Finland or Uzbekistan are located in, not of course in that, that dire situation like Israel, but still there um, you know, surroundings, their international environment is very complicated and uh, they need to be very delicately balancing to achieve their own sustainability and uh, being able to flourish. So I would try to propose five components of the strategy that can be productive, effective in this crumbling state of affairs. And I think that the non-aligned countries are maximizing those aspects of their strategy. Um, the basic definition of strategy is the ability to correlate your foreign policy goals with your resources. And if a country is very experienced in uh, you know, this foreign policy process of uh, developing appropriate goals and knows well how to correspond those goals with resources, how to supply them with resources, um, those countries, they succeed the most. It's actually not that, you know, 
simple to develop a foreign policy goal that is both achievable, that is necessary, that is not illusory, and that is that has uh, national consensus. And uh, those countries that uh, can develop those kind of goals, they sustain themselves best. Those countries that are divided inside, that cannot form a consensus, that are lost in transition somehow, they are in a deadlock and we see a lot of, uh, you know, government experience. Uh, one of the latest, I think Armenia was the victim of this internal undecidedness, uh, unfocused uh, condition, a country that has uh, eventually abandoned its uh, most necessary foreign policy goal of defending Nagorno-Karabakh and lost a war with a competitor that was very focused on why, what, and how it wants to achieve. So those are the five uh, components of the strategy uh, that I think works best in this current environment. And by the, those components, I mean that the foreign policy elites should be able to develop those uh, parameters. Um, and they come with experience, experience of conflict, both conflict and negotiation. They come with strategic culture. They come with a track record of uh, leadership. So sum up, what are those five, five uh, perks, five abilities? The first one is very simply common sense. Common sense is not that very widespread in the current media mainstream. And the common sense is the ability of ruling elites to correctly trace the cause and effect relationship in what is happening around the world and formulate their own foreign policy goals based on genuine rather than the imaginary needs. In other words, to the ability to correctly recognize one's own needs and not set the false goals. So the goals that you are you know, proposing to your society, to, to your country, they can be false ones. They can be either unachievable or they can lead a country to a state where eventually you would lose your internal cohesion or you would lose your focus on what actually means uh, for you to, to exist and why you exist, why you're here. And uh, this common sense thing is actually uh, like the, the antidote of uh, toward to ideological foreign policy. When you have an idea that basically, uh, you know, crushes every rational reasoning uh, in Russian history, we had an experience when ideology prevailed and uh, it never delivered uh, the results that can be assessed as a ne top national priority. Second, and, 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 and we see a lot of uh, countries uh, in Europe and elsewhere that are you know, too much ideologically motivated and thus uh, not realistic in, in their foreign policy ends. Second is strategic culture. Elites should have, should have an ability to accumulate the strategic culture, which is seen as a kind of a track record of using force in past. And consequently, after using force to, uh, to lead a, a, a diplomatic engagement, because every war essentially leads to a peace and you need to be able to both wage a war and uh, reach uh, an agreement, a diplomatic agreement. Uh, basically, the diplomatic agreements about the results of war are more important than the war itself. We have in history uh, several episodes when the war was fought badly, but the diplomatic uh, consequences of it were not that bad. And vice versa, when the war was you know, a perfect victory, but due to the international complications and the influence of other actors, it uh, achieved a very limited uh, political political results. And of course, in the 21st century, we see plenty of military conflicts where, where a political result is negligible, like American intervention in Iraq and Afghanistan cost like $2 trillion and politically achieved negligible results. That is basically twice, uh, twice a Russia GDPs. Like you can build two countries like Russia with achieving what? Um, so it's actually very hard for a country which have a limited experience of both war and diplomatic engagement, tough diplomatic 
hard diplomacy to achieve this strategic culture. But you can import some of the strategic thinkers like United States did with the German, Austrians and uh, Hungarians in like during and after the Second World War, great influx of the great minds in the American strategy and the sophisticated thinking. In Russia, I think we have a, a well, with Turkey, we are having the uh, Guinness World Records of having the, the, the biggest number of mutual wars, 12 wars between one another, and that is not a world record you would like to beat. But uh, it actually leads you to developing a very sophisticated diplomatic corps and very able military corps. And uh, I think Russia is a country that has an ability to accumulate a strategic culture for the throughout its, its, its history. Of being, uh, and now it, it understands how much force it should imply to achieve much bigger political effect. Third component, so the first two were common sense and strategic culture. The third component is leadership. Leadership is not that easy in current international affairs because due to populist wave, we have a lot of leaders that sound strong, but actually are not able to, uh, you know, to show significant will or determination and preparedness to sacrifice. That is the, the biggest thing. When a country is able to sacrifice something to achieve its goal, like we observe, uh, I would not point out uh, currently the, um, the foreign policy examples of a weak leadership, but in Europe, we see plenty of it, like sounding strong, doing almost almost nothing to deter significant security risks. And uh, we see that the world is growing increasingly anarchic. And this means that you would have to sacrifice. Uh, you would need to sacrifice your own um, like military personnel to maintain stability on your borders. You need to sacrifice some of your political legitimacy to enforce the structure, the rule of order. Uh, the uh, maintain stability itself. And uh, you would need to do this while simultaneously maintaining your society safe and well fed. And uh, uh, in, in the best case scenario, you, you need to maintain the full form of democracy. The fourth uh, perk is, the, is empathy. Empathy is a kind of a part of strategic culture, but I put it out and, and uh, describe it um, as a single standing ability because this is the foundation of the constructive strategy that takes into consideration the interests of all parties involved, inclu including your enemy. So to achieve a durable victory over your enemy, you need to provide your enemy with something that would be sufficient for your enemy to agree with. So, okay, this was my defeat, but it's an honorable defeat. And uh, for now, I agree with it. And let us turn the page. To develop this, you need to develop your uh, proper understanding of how your opponent thinks, uh, what is the, you know, the most urgent goals your opponent want to achieve, and try not to you know, ruin those goals. That is important if you do not want to piss off your opponent to the point that it would have a revenge as the you know, top national priority. This is very bad. This is very bad. And we have several, uh, in, in, on the globe, we have several international conflicts that are focused on this revenge dynamic. And it, it, it's always, always very um, catastrophic, I would say, for regional security. And the fifth, and I, th I think I will close there, is the organi organizational resource. Organizational resource is the ability to focus to rally your resources, your support, and to, to focus on the key development tasks. Uh, this is hard because in the current, you know, very well fed and uh, you know, properly developed society, people like to relax and people like to, um, you know, contemplate and uh, not being focused on the urgent needs of, of of development. And everybody thinks that you know, we turn the page of the ugly conflicts of the 20th century. Now we want to consume, now we want to, you know, we want to flourish. Why are you, you know, forcing us to focus on the development goals? Um, and, and, and it's really hard. It's really hard. It's really hard to 
to show your your elites and uh, your society that look guys this is what we want and we cannot get there without focusing on what we want and uh, how you achieve this uh, focus through your organizational resource is uh, we have on the planet a different examples of, 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 of how people do it of course the most um, you know starking example of it is Israel where men and women are, are serving in the uh, military and uh, they basically have two military uniforms the war uniform and interwar uniform they don't have a you know peacetime uniform um, they are focused on the basic task of survival of Israel states in this uh, complicated region uh, we haven't seen this kind of attitude from from Armenia throughout this conflict, and uh, I think this is uh, what also drives the the results of, of, of the current engagement. I think I'll stop here, but I'm sure that uh, I, I essentially touched so many topics that throughout the discussion we would uh, have an opportunity to to develop uh, some of them. Um, so fifth parameters of a proper strategy that is common sense aggregate strategic culture, leadership, empathy, and organizational resource. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrew, for your brilliant presentation. In fact, and now Nandan, uh, I have a question for you. Uh, I've read many articles in Indian newspapers and a lot of papers of Indian experts. Some of them say that India needs non-alignment 2.0. Someone writes that it's time for India to abandon its non-alignment policy and finally join someone. Uh, someone is usually uh, means the United States. Uh, recently, the concept of multi-alignment has become very popular in India. That is to join all formats in general while avoid, avoiding taking responsibilities. Uh, I personally get the impression that this is a form of non-alignment only named differently so as not to evoke associations well with the uh, old term. Am I right? Uh, you also have 20 minutes, of course. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for inviting me. I have to thank the organizers. Uh, such an interesting uh, gathering and my distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you. After the uh, uh, addresses made or presentations made, uh, both by Mr. Sushinsov and Mr. Kuprianov, there is very, very little for me to really add. But uh, since there is a direct question, I will uh, <clears throat> take this question last so that I can manage to put in a little bit of whatever I had prepared uh, before that. Uh, before I continue, I'd like to start with one small caveat warning, is that uh, I was an academic many, many years ago. I, in between, had 25 years of journalism so that has unfortunately taught me to speak very short because you know space in journalism is very little. So I will be very, very direct and I am afraid I may not be able to consume the full 20 minutes that Alexei has so kindly allotted to me. Before I approach the question of uh, uh, what is the debate in India, I would like to uh, try and give you some of the context of where this debate is coming from. And then it'll be easy to understand uh, why these questions about India's uh, current stance are coming up. You know, what we saw is if we go back, let's go back to where modern day academics consider history began. That is 1991, collapse of Soviet Union. Now, uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, we saw the end of bipolarity as we know it, classical bipolarity, and we saw the emergence of a unipolar moment. Uh, for a variety of reasons, that unipolar moment did not survive, uh, not in the least because I think, I mean, this is my personal opinion, I think the US elites were ill-equipped to deal with the possibility of actually leading the world and they still pursued their narrow interest. And in that process, uh, they lost what could have been uh, a really long-term Pax Americana. 
But nevertheless, that's my personal opinion. I'm sure we will have others who think differently. Uh, however, gradually after the unipolar moment started uh, declining, uh, you've also had simultaneously another factor, and that is the rise of another power, which is uh, China. Uh, the problem of the decline of the United States has also been worsened by the fact that the United States lost a, a considerable amount of its goodwill uh, because of uh, you know, this policy of uh, um, uh, liberal intervention or intervening into other countries, seeking regime change because you wanted to install a government which was like us. You know, and unfortunately, this as usual ran into local nationalisms and gave rise to nationalisms. And in some cases, uh, uh, populist leaders came to take advantage of this. And of course, also what exacerbated uh, the problem was the fact that globalization as such had a certain amount of unequal distribution of the largesse of globalization. The gains of globalization were not distributed equally. So uh, coming now to this phase when the so-called unipolar moment dissolved, we have reached a stage where we really don't know what is going to emerge as a stable uh, system after a period of time. It's very popular now to call this as a state of flux. Uh, but where most uh, experts agree is that we are likely to see the emergence of some form of multipolarity. Now, I know that Russia's uh, experts prefer to call this polycentricism, but uh, for the ease of what flows directly from my tongue, it's just easier for me to say multipolarity. Uh, uh, and in this multipolarity, it is also quite clear that US and China are likely to be the two big, biggest players. And this is a relationship that is going to, uh, in many ways, define the uh, evolving world order. Experts also believe that along with uh, these uh, two powers, there are several other sort of middle rank powers that will influence the emergence of the new world. And amongst them, they're variously listed, Germany, Japan, Russia, of course, India, and others. Now, I don't uh, necessarily agree with this uh, view because I genuinely believe that the only country that uh, can, in a sense, uh, not be included in the uh, uh, either US or China uh, uh, sort of uh, camp, if you want, is really Russia because uh, all the other countries that I mentioned, whether it is Germany or Japan, for example, they are tied into a security arrangement with the United States. Uh, so yes, they have a certain amount of uh, agency as Andre had earlier said, but uh, the fact of the matter is that on all important strategic issues, their thinking is going to be more or less aligned with the leader of the Western world. As for India, uh, I will come to this towards the end of uh, my presentation, but I'm not certain that India has yet uh, reached the level where uh, it has the uh, kinetic capability of influencing world events. It definitely does have the potential, but there is much that India has to do yet to learn. Uh, in fact, all the five points that uh, were listed so uh, comprehensively by Andre are things that the Indian strategic uh, policymakers really have to take into consideration and improve all five points. Uh, now, we therefore, the situation where you have, you don't have bipolarity, you don't have a clear cut emerge situation of who are the powers around, there calls for a slightly different uh, strategy than non-alignment. And this is variously called, you know, multi-alignment and non-alignment 2.0. Uh, 
But essentially, Alexei, and this is in response partly to one question that you asked, is that I would call it, and I'm going back to my journalist days, uh, I would just call this simply and straightforward as a hedging policy. You, there is a multiplicity of interests in this world. There are some issues on which a country may or may not align with somebody. And there are issues on which you will align with that same country. So therefore, you are going to try and develop a, a maximally good relationship with all powers, whether it be the higher powers like the United States or China or the middle rank and lower powers. So there, for example, if you look at India, India is a classic example of the last 10 years trying to develop uh, good relationships with all parts. There are some conflict areas we have, for example, uh, with, uh, let's, uh, with say China. But at the same time, we are in organizations like the SCO and BRICS with China. We are practically on the same side with China on issues like climate change. So, you know, there will be a confluence of circumstances in which there will be uh, areas of common interest. There will also be areas of uh, common differences, which are inescapable. And I think, again, uh, Alexei was a little modest, but Russia has uh, very quickly learned to play this game of uh, non-alignment. I mean, it has, and I'm talking of non-alignment not only between uh, uh, China and the USA, but look at Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Russia played the non-alignment game, if you want, between Armenia and uh, Arme Azerbaijan very, very well. It did not harm its relationship with Azerbaijan, and it yet maintains a security relationship and a fairly good relationship with Armenia. And in the process, it has injected its troops into the area. It has got a presence in the area and has reaffirmed that yes, there could be some other external powers, but we are going to be the main determinant of security in this region. So I think uh, it is, uh, uh, would be unfair to say that Russia is got a lot to learn in uh, terms of uh, uh, how to play the non-alignment game. The other thing in which I would also uh, somewhat uh, disagree with Alexei is in his opening remarks, he talked about uh, Russia being defeated in the Cold War. Uh, you know, my problem with that historical look is that then you're carrying with you the legacy of that defeat. Yes, of course, at a, some level that defeat is there, it rankles. But the point is what emerged after the Cold War, that Russia that emerged presumably is a completely different country. Yes, its strategic uh, interests are uh, somewhat similar, but nevertheless, having broken up, having lost 14 other components of the Soviet Union, uh, Russia is an entirely new country, although it has inherited some of the attributes of the Soviet Union, membership in the United Nations Security Council, veto power, and so on and so forth. So I would not think that uh, I, would, I would not treat Russia as a power that was defeated. There was another country, it was genuinely defeated. And out of that churn that took place after the defeat, a new kind of Russia emerged. That would be my view of this. Yes, there may be a psychological carry on of, uh, uh, you know, rankling defeat, but that is possible. Uh, now to, sorry, uh, now uh, we come to the question of what essentially is this hedging? Now, if you look at Asia, and really we are talking about multipolarity and non-alignment, Asia is a classic case. If you look at Asia, you find that, uh, all through since uh, the Second World War, uh, the United States was able to imprint a particular kind of security architecture in this region. So you had countries like Singapore and all part of a certain footprint that the United States had. At the same time, these countries were particularly, for example, ASEAN countries, uh, economically went much, much closer to the uh, Chinese. As China developed, 
ASEAN also develops and the closeness of the relationship is apparent. And therefore today, for example, when the, uh, I won't call it conflict, but the tensions uh, between uh, China and the United States spill over into the uh, uh, trade area also, uh, the ASEAN countries, particularly the Southeast Asian countries, feel themselves particularly uncomfortable because they do not want to take sides. They are so invested in their economic relationship with the uh, Chinese, with the People's Republic of China, that they are not willing to, at this point of time, uh, pick any side or respond to demands of the United States uh, with uh, respect to uh, taking sides. So therefore, you will find some of the closer allies maybe responding to the uh, demands of decoupling their economic relationship with China. So you find Japan making some kind of noises about it. You may even find India uh, making noises about it. India's case is again, I'll leave it till the end because it's a slightly more complicated. But the fact of the matter is that none of these countries envisage their economic growth without decoupling. But at the same time, on the other hand, they need the United States because many of them have strategic frictions with China. I mean, just to take uh, the South China Sea, for example, as a place where many of these countries have problems. Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, to name just a few. So therefore, the policy has become one of hedging. It is not non-alignment in the classical sense. It is a policy of hedging where in spheres of interest, you do align with one power. In spheres of uh, uh, friction, you align with a set of another powers. These, this will keep changing. Uh, this is uh, right now, because we are in a state of flux, I don't think that the countries have a choice of making a choice. They have to maintain good relationships with everyone. Uh, I also believe that, of course, uh, uh, we have certain theories like the theory by um, uh, Amitabh Acharya, who says that the world that is developing is not a multipolar world, but a multiplex world. And by that, he means that uh, this is not just about, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, a sort of a strategic multipolarity, but this world is far more complex because it is interconnected and interdependent. And therefore, you, uh, it is not something about, it's not a binary choice between a liberal order and an authoritarian order, but you will have a mix of everything in whatever the new order that emerges. Uh, having said that, now if I may come back to the final bit about India itself. In India, the situation, given all this, is a little complicated. For many years prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, India was a leader of the non-aligned movement. But at the same time, uh, India was in a strategic sense, uh, the closest, India's closest uh, friend was the Soviet Union. And that was particularly true, let's say in 1971, when uh, India signed a treaty of friendship with the Soviet Union, because uh, it was worried that in the crisis around uh, the creation of Bangladesh, there would be an intervention uh, by either China or the United States. And it is the fact that they had a treaty with the USSR that prevented any kind of uh, uh, escalation of that uh, conflict. However, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, India found itself at a loose end, if I may say. Not only was there a crisis internationally, but there was a crisis domestically. India's economy was uh, beginning to tank. We had reached a stage where we had to send our gold to Singapore to get money. So India launched a series of economic reforms, which coincided with what was happening in Russia. Russia was also economically deploying, declining in the early 90s because it was transforming from a socialist economy to a capitalist economy. 
So naturally, both Russia and India were looking west for solutions. And there is no other option for either of them. And as a result of that, uh, India developed a fairly good relationship with uh, a variety of new countries. Today, the situation is that up to a point because India did not want a hegemony of the United States, India did align with it aligned many of its interests with the other powers, including Russia, China, and all those who were uh, willing to dilute the unipolar moment, as it were. But once this unipolarity was diluted and there was a new world emerging, India has found itself at another crossroad. Its big neighbor, China, and India have a territorial dispute, and suddenly that territorial dispute has emerged central to our relationship. And this is going to uh, overweigh uh, all the foreign policy decisions that India is likely to take. And the problem that arises here is that, and I'm being very blunt about this, what are the choices that India has? India is not uh, sufficiently strong on its own to be able to deal with a dispute with China militarily. So it requires an external balancer. And today, given the closeness of earlier, that external balancer was the Soviet Union. But today, given the closeness of the relationship between uh, Russia and China, while there is no doubt that uh, Russia is not reneging on any of its commitments, the point is Indian elites are slightly apprehensive as to how far this relationship can uh, be sustained. And therefore, sorry, and therefore, uh, there is an attempt to build a relationship with the United States. But at the same time, while there is an attempt to build a close relationship with the United States, there is also uh, the understanding that a country like the United States, which has been a unipolar superpower, probably does not know how to do equal relationships. And because it doesn't know how to do equal relationships, Russia, India is hedging its bets by also maintaining its relationships in organ with Russia, of course, but also in multilateral organizations like uh, the BRICS and SCO and others. So therefore, my point is, I don't think that India is playing non-alignment 2.0 or it is playing any kind of other game. I just think that India has reached a stage where it has a multiplicity of interests. Some of these interests are common with China. Some of these interests are common with Russia. Some of these interests are common with the United States. And India is going to pursue these interests with these countries. I only hope, final word, is that the Indian elites stay on this course. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nandan. I would like to make just a humble remark. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union often aligned itself with some rivals against others. For example, during the Suez crisis, the United, uh, Soviet Union and the United States together forced Britain and France to retreat. And in the economy, a, a third of the United, uh, USSR, well, foreign trade, went to the Western countries at the height of the American sanctions. That is the concept of being friends in one occasion with some and on another with others and not something new. It's a game that all sides played in one way or another, even during the classic Cold War. Well, in fact, I have a lot of questions for distinguished speakers, but we have little time, so I will leave this pleasure to others. Uh, and we already have the first question. This is a question from Timofey Bardachev. Timofey, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. I actually have a question to both speakers. One question about Russian policy, one possibly about Indian policy. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, Andre, thank you very much for your excellent description of uh, what are the main requirements for the national foreign policies to feed uh, to feed their, uh, their, their, the changing circumstances of international politics. But however, we all know from the textbooks of history of, of the international relations that Russian foreign policy has been always connected to the very huge and important ethical dimension. 
and the moral dimension understood in the terms of the mission of Russia to promote justice and to consider justice among the people and among the countries as a departure point of Russian foreign policy. And we see, for example, under the case of this Transcaucasian conflict uh, last month, that Russia did not have significant geostrategic motivations to intervene because the changing of the situation was not threatening to Russian security, but Russia has offered itself to, to the peacekeeping mission for the reasonable amount on, on, the, on the background, on the, on the, on the basics uh, of, uh, of morality. So whilst everybody becomes pragmatic and international politics are very demanding, what do you think about the role of the mission, justice and morality in the future Russian foreign policy? And the second question is to Nandan. Nandan, I belong to the generation of those people who remember India as a leader of their non-alignment movement. And uh, by that time, we, we had a widespread impression of the Indian foreign policy being a sort of their alternative to Soviet and uh, American confronting totalitarian visions of the global affairs. So India at that time was representing uh, uh, a sim was embodiment of the democratic approach to the international affairs uh, and as, a, as, as an opposition, as a positive opposition to, to confronting totalitarian ideologies, liberalism and communism. So do you think that we should at a certain time after the certain developments expect, expect India to return to this role out of the context of the present conflict of China and US, but to the stage of the global representation of the certain values in foreign policy. Thank you both. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your questions are always stimulating, intellectually inducing, like a spark in the engine. And uh, I initially, you know, uh, wanted to, to, to develop an idea that would be long as the lecture, but I would uh, finish with the short quote from Henry Kissinger, which I'm sure that uh, all of us know, no stability is possible without balance. No justice is possible without self-restraint. And uh, I think this uh, understanding of justice as self-restraint is very important because the um, uh, the the situation when you're a victor, when you have achieved your goal, and you now have at your disposal the situation at your disposal, is very tempting to everybody. It's an open question: What would Soviet Union do if the United States would collapse in 1991? And how would Soviet Union conduct itself? Would it be so self-restrained, or it would do the you know symmetrical things, the the mirroring the the policies of of um, United States, and thus leading toward a new crisis? And uh, I'm sure that, in my experience, show that a man is not perfect, that state is not perfect, that all of us are making mistakes. It's very hard to be self-restrained. Justice is hardly achievable, but this delicate balance between your ambition and uh, what is actually good for you is really necessary, is really necessary. So current Russian pragmatism, I think, can be discussed in moral terms, in ethical, an ethical dimension of Russian pragmatism is actually an argument of that Russian pragmatism is an ethical position, this argument is possible. And this ethical position is that self-restraint is necessary in the crumbling world order. Even though you can achieve much more when everybody else you know, crumbles and you're being able and uh, you have a will, willpower, you have resources, you can do what you want, but you're not doing what you want. You do what is necessary for achieving your immediate uh, interests. And also, I think uh, this question about the Russian mission, there is a 
justice promotion, and we saw that you know this Russian proverb, "Благими намерениями выложен дорога в ад." So all good good um, good intentions lead to hell, basically. We saw plenty of examples when in in last twenty years when the uh, you know eagerness to deliver justice led to the opposite, like hundreds of thousands of people dead, uh, complete injustice, ruining of order, civil war and all things. I think the promotion of mercy can be a, a good mission, an ethical mission, moral obligation, promotion of mercy, milosirdia. And how you can do it, you can do it like by caring to those in trouble, not those who are unjust and we will deliver justice, but caring for those who are in trouble. And I think what Russia did to Armenia it was the policy of mercy. We are providing necessary assistance that prevent that pre prevents suffering uh, excessive suffering i would close here uh, i will second uh, andre in saying that timofey always asks uh, uh, but i won't be nice and kind to him i'll say difficult questions <laughs> so the fact of the matter is timofey you asked a question that is part of the debate that is taking place in India today. It is between so-called Nehruvian foreign policy and modern pragmatic foreign policy. Uh, Nehruvian foreign policy is what you described as India's, you know, the third way, a democratic leader of the rest of the world against these two totalitarian visions of the world. Uh, the problem that arises today is that India is going through some fundamental internal changes, both at the political, social, and the economic level. So I think these fundamental changes that India is undergoing and the demands that India has in terms of development are forcing the debate about this whole thing about are values relevant in foreign policy or does foreign policy uh, ruthlessly pursue the interests of uh, under whatever domestic compulsions you have. Today, I would say that the uh, pragmatists, or the, they like to call themselves realists, uh, today I would say that the realists are in command. Uh, but uh, will India come back to the origins? Yes, I think eventually uh, India will come back to those origins because it will be very, very difficult to uh, fundamentally restructure the political system in India without maintaining some of those attributes of a democracy. And given that those attributes will uh, remain, I also suspect that the ruling elites will also change. It may take longer than people expect. It may take two, three decades, but that will happen. And then India's foreign policy will return to those fundamental roots. But however, one issue will always remain that, and this is true even of Nehru or uh, Indira Gandhi's foreign policy, India ruthlessly pursued its national interest. When it was required, India deployed troops in 1961 to evict Portugal out of Goa. When required, India resorted to military action in 1971 against uh, uh, East Pakistan then, but what became subsequently Bangla Bangladesh. When required, India did deploy troops in Sri Lanka. When there was a coup in the Maldives in the late 80s, which was not reflective of India's foreign policy, it is Indian commandos who went there and engineered a regime change, bringing back the old regime into power. So India, despite being uh, the ethical leader, if you want, of non-alignment, was never averse to using its uh, fundamental, uh, never was willing to compromise its fundamental interests. Thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, dear friends, I don't see any more hands, which means uh, that there are no questions. It's very fortunate because we also ran out of time. I would like to thank our speakers and everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to moderate this session. I enjoyed it and I hopefully you too. Thank you.